all of the discussion tells me that it's a good time. We want to continue to do this over the next few weeks, at least in our Nehemiah series. We're going to continue to do this uh, as we see through the book of Nehemiah. Uh, the together part of what they were accomplishing was so important. And uh, building together, the vision together, the driving forward together, the accomplishing together, all of those things come together. And uh, over this uh, next five or six weeks as we continue this series, I want to continue to come back to the, the together part of this. And so we'll try this for a little while and bring the coffee in here and take our time in the middle here. We need to continue to build the together. And so I encourage you to take full advantage of that time. Let's pray as we settle in here. Our Father in heaven, uh, thank you for your church. Thank you for this group of people. Thank you that you are present. But now, Father, as we, as we settle into your word here, may it seem like we're just curling up in the couch beside the fire. We're nestling into you. We want to know you. We want to know you more. We want to become more and more like Jesus. We want to change the world for your sake. So God, as a result of the next 30 minutes or so, open our eyes. Poke us where we need to be poked. Push us where we need to be pushed. Kick us where we need to be kicked. Or maybe just gently compel us towards you with the beauty of your steadfast love. But speak to us, melt us, mold us, and shape us as we, as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were not here last week, let me really encourage you to go back and to listen to that that message. Uh, you can get it on CD or DVD through our office. It's on our website. It's online. It's on the app. But go back and, and have a, a listen through that. That really sets the foundation for this whole thing that we're doing over the next bunch of weeks. This series will look more than anything at this. God gives the vision and the direction Will the people band together to make it happen? In last week's introduction to this whole book, Nehemiah's heart was broken when he heard what was going to happen, or what had happened, what was going on in Jerusalem. And like many people, he was living in Persia a long way um, and long after the exile in Babylon had finished. Some had gone home and they had rebuilt the temple, very little else. But Nehemiah was one of the many that were still living a far way off from God's dream and from God's plan for them as a people. So here's where we ended up last week. We almost always settle into the path of least resistance. These folks repeated the up and down pattern of the previous generations. They were punished by God. They were exiled by God as an act of discipline, as a correction line for the way they had lived and worshipped. God was not happy. And so after almost 200 years, they were back, they went back home, they rebuilt exactly what God had disciplined them for. They were so wrapped up in getting their lives back, in restoring their traditions, in reestablishing their historic ways of following God, that they totally missed the coming of their Messiah. They missed Jesus. Well, how do we avoid those same patterns? How do we actually move forward instead of back? And the first building block in this we looked at last week was a heart broken by the same things that break God's heart. So in the beginning of the book of Nehemiah, this is where we were last week. We just looked at the first four verses. And in verse four, in verse four, we saw that when he heard this news of what was the condition of God's people and God's city, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. 
His heart was broken for the condition of God's people. Their question last week was, what breaks your heart? What is it with you that that God breaks your heart with the same things that are breaking his heart? Your hearts are beating together and aligned. So here's what Nehemiah does. He prays. In verse 5 to 11 that Audrey read for us this morning already, that's his prayer. And at the end of that, there's a little phrase there that doesn't seem to fit. It's not part of the prayer that ends halfway through verse 11. It's not part of the next section that starts in chapter 2. It's just a phrase that says, Now I was the cupbearer to the king. And, and, and as much as that little phrase is odd, st- sitting out there, it's kind of stuck out all by itself there, uh, that's a really interesting thing. And it gives us a lot of insight into Nehemiah. And in a sense... It explains a lot of the perspective of his prayer. That word cupbearer, we see it 12 times in the Old Testament. It, it basically means butler. That's the literal translation. But we see it in 1 Kings chapter 10 and in 2 Chronicles chapter 9 and used, uh, used with, uh, with King Solomon. And that's the situation in both of those where the Queen of Sheba had come to visit him to check out this, these stories that they had heard about how wise Solomon was. And she came prepared with her gun loaded of questions. It says he answered them all brilliantly. And she was blown away. And she, she poured gifts out on him and everything. And part of her statement to him was how much God had blessed you. And in the middle of that, listing all of these things that God had blessed him, she praises his cupbearer. Interesting. In Genesis chapter 40 and 41, the, the cupbearer comes up a bunch of times. And this is when, when Joseph was in prison. And uh, people around him are having dreams and he's interpreting the dreams. One of those people was the cupbearer for the king. The cupbearer and the baker were both in prison with, uh, with, Daniel at, or with Joseph at that point. There's lots of other ancient documents that talk about the cupbearers for the kings in these days. Some of them tell us that there's other responsibilities that go along with it. Um, The Greek historian uh, Xenophon says that part of the cupbearer's responsibility was to take a drink of whatever he was giving the king to drink to test first to see if it's poisonous or if it's okay to drink. There's some evidence that Nehemiah here would have been a eunuch. All of that from this little phrase, is that information we need? Maybe to know he's a eunuch is too much information. Does it matter? It's interesting. But I think that that little phrase gives us a lot of insight into his prayer. And I hope we can learn from that. Here is a guy who comes into the presence of the king several times every day. What would happen if he came into the presence of the king with a flippant attitude? What would come in if he was a little too, what would happen if he came in a little too easygoing? Or over the course of time just became more and more comfortable so he was more and more casual? As you would assume, the protocol for coming into the king was pretty strict. And there was a lot of expectations for how he would behave and what he would do and the things he would say. And this is Artaxerxes the king, and the king right before this was Xerxes. And archaeology has, has found documents and even stone inscriptions and pictures and and that kind of stuff of Artaxerxes and all the people around him and everyone that came into Artaxerxes presence had to do so and the entire time they would have to have their hand in front of their face what does that say what does that do interesting things all to say there's certain protocol that has to happen here and as we dig into Nehemiah's prayer it's almost like He's following the proper protocol of being in the presence of the king. If he had a question to ask King Artaxerxes, how would he do that? Would he come in with his head bowed, with his hand in front of his face? Would he he wait and posture himself properly? Oh, great Artaxerxes, I am not worthy to be in your presence. Oh, great king, may you live forever. Only your grace allows me to be in your presence. I'm only here because I'm your humble servant. And honor. You would assume that would be the way he would approach his boss, the king in this. 
What about when we get to come into the presence of the Almighty King? We can go to, into His presence, into His throne room, as much as we want. The Gospels in, in Luke, when, when Jesus died on the cross in the temple, and the, the curtain in the temple was torn apart, exposing the Holy of Holies, the place that only the priest could go once a year, with a rope tied around him. In case he died, they could pull him out, because no one went there. The curtain is ripped into, we have access to God himself in his holy place. In Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about approaching the throne with confidence. But what about when we go into the presence of the Most High King? Do we just barge in? Are we flippant? Are we very respectful? I think as we look at this simple prayer here in Nehemiah chapter 1, we can learn some, some pretty critical, important things about prayer. I hope we come away with one clear thing this morning. Let's look at that prayer. Can I read it again? If you have a Bible, Nehemiah chapter 1. This is what he prayed, verse 5. O Lord, God of heaven, and the great, awesome God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night. For the people of Israel, your servants, and confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept your commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, then your outcasts are in the outermost parts of Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. I want to break down that prayer and look at it in different sections here. And there's four things I see all tied together. And in the end, I want us to, to clearly see one thing. All right? Well, let's work our way through this prayer. First was, was verse 4 where we were last week. And I won't spend a lot of time on this. But here, the, the, the first element of prayer is that God grabs his heart. When God grabs his heart, he prays. Nehemiah has never lived in Jerusalem. This is about a hundred years since Babylon was crushed by, by Persia and the people were decreed they can go home and rebuild. This is a hundred years later and he's the cupbearer to king. So unless he's 180 years old, he never lived in Jerusalem before this. So here's a, here's a guy who's a, probably a young man who grew up there, understood that's all he knows. He knows his grandfather lived in Jerusalem. He knows the stories from Scripture and God's holy city. But he's never lived there. How bent out of shape would you be if the city your grandfather used to live in and told you about was laying in ruins? It doesn't really affect my life. He hears about the destruction of Jerusalem and it grips him. And he weeps and mourns over it for days. Jesus in Luke 19 is riding into the city of Jerusalem for his last time. Knowing what's ahead, he's going to complete God's work. He's going to go to the cross. He knows full well that these people have completely missed the Messiah's coming. They didn't get it. They didn't want it. And he weeps over the city. His heart is broken and I think one of the key things with that is that we begin to see the world through God's eyes when we let him grip our heart. To see the world through his eyes, to see your neighbors or the people you work with. Not only that, maybe to see the content you're learning at school through the eyes of God or to see the, the teenager that's got himself or herself into all kinds of trouble. How do we see through God's eyes and let God's 
break, let God break our heart with what breaks his heart. We grieve as God grieves for what God grieves for. To rightly see the world as God sees it. I was gripped this week as I studied this, and we'll get into this in a, in a minute, to, to stop praying for what I want and to start praying for His will. And I know that, and I do that, but I was still gripped with how much of our prayer is really centered and starts with what I need. God said to me this week, are you concerned with his will or with my will? This is Nehemiah's prayer as we dig into it. It's about God's will. It's about God's heart. That's where it starts. And I wonder if we're actually, if we're honest, how much we're actually afraid of God's desire for my life. What he wants to do. Chances are it's different than what I want. Well, this is where we ended off last week. A heart broken with the same thing that breaks God's heart. And this point in Nehemiah, at this point, everything changes in his life. Everything is known. Everything is prepared for. His job, his life, his home. Everything changes here when God breaks his heart. He moves eventually, as we'll see as we get to the end of the book. He he was the cupbearer for a king, a servant. He becomes a governor. There's a long road between those. Guaranteed that he's serving the king his drinks. He never expected that kind of stuff to happen. Chapter, verse 5. And I said, O Lord of God, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps the covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Because we hope, we worshipfully pray. Now, worship is not about us. It's completely about God. The starting and ending point of worship is God. It's not us. Likewise, prayer is not about us. Prayer is all about God. And Nehemiah begins his prayer with a declaration of who God is. Why do we hope? Why do we pray? Because we know God. And we know his character. If we're ever going to accept his will, his answers, his direction, or even be his change agents in the world, we need to know him. We need to know his heart and his character, his promises and his will. And Nehemiah, I don't think Nehemiah was praying because the problem was so bad. I think he was praying because he knew God was willing and able. He knew what God wanted. He knew what God's heart longed for. Look at the words Nehemiah uses in in this verse just to describe God. He calls him Lord. That's in charge, calling the shots, making up the rules. He calls him great and awesome. Boy, that word awesome has lost its meaning. Everything is awesome. He says God keeps. God treasures. He holds to. He's safe and they're secure. God is steadfast. He's unmoving, secure, solid, dependable, unchanging. And love, unconditional, undeserved, regardless love. But then he has an aspect of mutual love where we have the option of loving God back. The mutual keep where we have the option of keeping too. When we love what he loves, we keep what he keeps. Nehemiah's prayer starts right off with God. It's him first. Prayer starts with that. Our knowledge and understanding of God shapes our hope. It shapes our prayer. So here's the first thing I see. This is where prayer starts. Prayer starts with who God is, not with what I need. I could stop right there. That's my main point. Everything about prayer hangs on that. Prayer starts with who God is, not with what I need. Verse 6. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people which have sinned against you 
Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept your commandments, the statutes, the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Because we sinned, we humbly confess. We only pray because we're convinced of who God is. We only pray because we are convinced only God can change things because of who he is. And this is the starting point. Nehemiah knew that. He knew also that he was not God, that he was not perfect, that in fact, his starting position for change was helplessness. He was distant, separated, exiled. They, as a people, were distant and separated and exiled. Why? He says in verse 8, he knew God's warning from years before generations before he knew that God had said if you're unfaithful I will scatter you among the people and here's Nehemiah declaring you were true to your word God we are scattered across the world he knew that and it was because of their unfaithfulness so how does he pray he starts he starts right off he's thinking let's rewind back let's go back to how this started what got us there in the first place the sin Let's confront that. Let's confront our comfort and our preferences. My way over God's ways. God's ways. Let's forgive. forgive, Let's restore. Let's renew. But he also knew God's promise in verse 9. But if you return to me. And look at the words he uses. He uses the word gather. God's first condition had been activated they were unfaithful and they were scattered now nehemiah is going to god saying let's get this second condition activated this is the reason nehemiah is so seriously confessing their corporate sin he comes with a contrite heart and confession and he knew that their position in confession and repentance was the only thing that would regain god's favor Nehemiah was looking first to regain God's favor. Like David in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart. Now, now I can see and hear and walk in your plans. Now I am not in the way of what God wants to do. And he was gripped by the way the people, his people, had gone astray. God wants to carry out his will through our lives. God wants to carry out his will through our prayers. So he prays, God, we have strayed. We have not put you first. We have put ourselves ahead of your ways. Our love for ourselves has stepped ahead of our love for you. We confess our sins, my sin too. We've been unfaithful. We're scattered. Wow. You did what you said you were going to do. And so I stand here today, he says, in shambles, in ruins, broken and distant from your best. It's a wake-up call to realign, repent, renew. Look at his words. Return, gather, bring, chosen, dwell, redeem, power, strong hand. The words to realign, to return, to accept the correction line that has taken 200 years to get and repent and crawl back over and over. So what about you? What about me? What is God wanting to do through your life? Don't be confused. It's got nothing to do with talent or gifts or wealth or status. God wants you. First and foremost. And it's these kind of life-changing, and world-changing prayers that are the base of all of God's work on earth. Look at what we've got so far. Prayer starts with God, not with what I need. The first part of that then is putting myself in the right place, being right with Him, being where He wants me to be. Verse 8, let's read verse 8 to 11 again. 
Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, You are faithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and bring and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of the earth, from there I will gather them and bring them to my, the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. And verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, to the prayer of your servants who delight in fear in your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Because we believe, we persistently intercede. Now, intercede, really simple picture. If you've been around, you've heard me say this before. To intercede is to go between, to hold God's hand, to know him, to understand his will and his power and his dreams and his hopes, and to hold the hand of people. And to know that and to pull them together, to intercede, to be the go-between, to connect people to the hand and heart of God, to connect God to the, to the people. This is God's heart for his people. He knows that. This is God's heart for us. This is God's heart for our country and our church and our town. Will we connect people with God? Will we intercede? Interesting thing here is he comes to the end of his prayer and he hasn't prayed anything about the walls of Jerusalem. This is what got him bent out of shape in the first place. This is his quest. This is his dream. This is what he knows God's heart is for. But he doesn't even pray that. Why? Because in the way, there is something so much bigger. Something far more fundamental. It kind of tells me that maybe as he prayed, God gave him his plan. And God continued to speak to him. And here he is, this prayer, on this day, he's going into the presence of the king. And he's praying, God, give me favor in the sight of this man. I love that phrase, in this, this man. He knows who's in charge. He knows that God is God. And this king, as powerful as he is, is just a man like me. And he prays that way. But he trusted God with the promise of gathering and bringing back and renewing. He, he trusted God with that promise enough. He knew God's heart on that enough that he could focus his time praying on what God really, really wanted more. And I use the word persist. Persist. This passage doesn't tell us anything, although if we read it, it does. If you look in, in verse 1, it says it was in the month of Kislev. And if we look in chapter 2, verse 1, which is right after this prayer, it says it's in the month of Nisan. That's four months. So that means from the time his heart broke for this city... By the time his heart broke for these people in the condition, and he wept and mourned for days, and fasted and prayed for days, that was four months of seeking God. Am I willing to wait patiently? We sang a song this morning, Those That Wait Upon the Lord. Those that wait upon the Lord, patiently, persisting, waiting for God's timing, for God to unlock his will and his timing. But what is that song about? That song is about who God is. He's the defender of the weak. He comforts those who are in need. It's about his strength and his strong hand, and he's a provider. It's a song about who God is, and that's where waiting on the Lord starts. That's where prayer starts. We also sang... It's who you are, God. You're a good, good father. You're perfect in all your ways. Prayer starts right there. Because if I don't know that, if I don't believe that, I'm not going to pray. I pray because of who he is. Okay, let me pull all this together. I know our time is, is long gone. Prayer starts and ends with who God is. What was Nehemiah after? What was it that broke his heart? Where did this all start? Why did he go to God in the first place? The walls needed to be rebuilt. Yes. I'm sure over those four months, he prayed about that. Why isn't that recorded here? I think, as I said, there's something much more fundamental, 
much deeper than that, maybe even much simpler than that. God's plan was, that, was what Nehemiah was after. But he knew that it starts with who God is and what God wants most, me. The healing and restoration of us and our hearts comes first. Then our situation, then our future, then our needs. Maybe we might want to pattern our thoughts around this. Maybe not take this and make this our daily prayer. But maybe this is my daily heart. Who God is shapes everything. Me being right with God is where all of God's action starts. And it's where his heart is. It's thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I have to be honest, and I think with most of us, a lot of our prayer is, my will be done. Asking God to do what we need and what we want. We'll see next week that as he prays and as he goes to the king, that those prayers bring about the people, the resources, the miracles, everything they needed to accomplish God's plan. And God does that. And as we look ahead in our church in 2017, we're revving up uh, the, the, the possibility of an expanding our building. Blue Water in King Carden, our adopted daughter church, is moving out of the Davidson Center into something that they need bigger space. We're strategizing for assisting churches in our area and maybe even daughtering new churches. We've got to hire a new youth pastor. We have in, new interns coming this year. We have probably starting Alpha. We, we want to work hard at Community Impact and Winterfest next week and is a big part of those things. We had meetings this week about our budget and our annual meeting coming up. But all of that stuff, all of those dreams, all those plans, God gives the vision. Will we band together to make that happen? All of that stuff starts with each of us walking with God. It all ends with each of us walking with God. To know God, to become like Jesus to change our world. God gives them the vision and direction. Will they pull together to make it happen? God gives us the vision and the direction. Will we pull together to make it happen? It starts with every one of us. A heart that will willingly be broken by God. And being prepared spiritually, humble, and contrite heart. This is the book of Nehemiah. This starts with prayer. And prayer starts with who God is. Let me pray. Our Father, thank you for history being recorded in this way. Thank you for having your fingerprints all over the writings of Nehemiah. But God, as we conclude this today, I want to pray the words of prophet, the prophet Isaiah from Chapter 30, where he says, You, the Lord, long to be gracious to us. You wait on high to have compassion on us, for you are a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for you. God's people will weep no longer because you, O oh God, will surely be gracious at the sound of our cry. When you hear us, you will answer us. Oh, Father, wait, may we seek your heart. May we align with your heart. May we know your heart. Your will be done first in our hearts. And God, put us in a position to fulfill your favor, your grace, your plans, your desires in our world. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.